Hello and welcome to another session of Starting Conversations brought to you by the New Mexico Humanities Council. I'm Bethany Tabor, uh, your host, and this is the second installment of our series on journalism and democracy. Uh, today, we will be talking about the myriad challenges facing local newsrooms and publications. Um, much of these challenges have been brewing for a long time now and have also been exacerbated by uh, the pandemic and the challenges of 2020. Uh, this program is made possible through the Mellon Foundation and their initiative, Democracy and the Informed Citizen. And we're excited to welcome back our moderator, Megan Kamrick, who has put together a great li list of speakers and uh, a great series for us on this topic. Megan Kamrick is an award-winning journalist and radio producer based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She's currently the host of All Things Considered on KUNM FM in Albuquerque. She's a former TED speaker and current TED speaker coach. She has prepared a great program and I will let her take it from here. Thank you so much, Bethany. I'm going to start by um, sharing my screen real quick. And there we go. Everybody see it? Okay. And I'm not a, all that adept at PowerPoint, so, but I think we can do it. <laughs> I might have to move the box around so I can actually see what I mean. I just wanted to put this up there to give our audience a real quick snapshot because I have found, well, all of us know that our industry has been melting down for more than a decade, well before that. Um, a lot of people don't understand that. They actually think the news industry is doing great. And that's not true. Um, and I'm not bringing that up to whine about us losing jobs. It has an impact on democracy, it has an impact on all of you um, and what you are able to learn about, read about in your community and participate in democracy. So over half of the country's newspaper jobs have disappeared since 2008. Since two, actually, this is even more because I was treating in New York Times. Since 2004, over 1,800 newspapers have closed across the country. Most are weeklies in small communities. And more than 1,800 communities are now called news deserts. And what that means is where residents have limited access to the sort of credible, comprehensive news and information that feed democracy at the grassroots level. That's from a study out of the University of North Carolina that will be in the resource list with this video. More importantly, perhaps one in five newsroom employees live in New York, Los Angeles, or Washington, DC. And I bring that up because that means they're not here covering your local community. Why does this matter? Because according to a report by PEN America, local journalists are part of their communities. They have unparalleled knowledge of issues and events. They're also key to fostering trust, something in short supply these days. Um, they're uh, especially in our polarized country. They keep government officials accountable and keep citizens informed. For example, the Flint water crisis where the city changed the source of its water supply and ended up with contaminated water threatening thousands was first reported by the Flint Journal. No other news outlet covered this for at least nine months. And meanwhile, thousands of children were exposed to lead poisoning. So I'm gonna go to my other slide real quick. Let's see. Can you guys see my screen? I'm not sure if I stopped sharing or not. No, you stop. I stopped sharing. Okay, sorry. Let me share real quick. There are also numerous financial costs. This is from the Journal of Financial Economics. Megan, you're not in a presentation mode on the Thank slide. Thank you, Rashad. Just no realized problem. that. <laughs> uh, this is from the Journal of Financial Economics. It was on the podcast Hidden Brain called Starving the Watchdogs. Uh, following a newspaper closure, municipal borrowing costs increased by 5 to 11 basis points, costing the municipality an additional $650,000 per bond issue. This is effect is causal, it's not driven by underlying economic conditions. The loss of government monitoring resulting from a closure is associated with higher government wages, deficits and increased likelihoods, costly advance refundings and negotiated sales, bond talk for, it's gonna cost you a lot more to build your bridges and your roads when your newspaper closes. Overall, our results indicate that local newspapers hold their governments accountable, keep municipal borrowing costs low and ultimately save taxpayers money. So that's the financial cost. Uh, clearly, there's more costs than that. Local news outlets 
often don't have the resources to cover everything that needs to be covered on top of all those challenges, the growing distrust and hostility towards media has put journalists at risk. And we've already seen one mass shooting in a newsroom in the last few years during protests this year. There were numerous instances of law enforcement deliberately targeting journalists who were doing their jobs. These threats come on top of the coronavirus pandemic, which has made it even more difficult to do our jobs safely and the resulting economic meltdown. So before we get too down in the weeds today, we have an excellent panel of journalists to talk about these issues. Uh, Julianne Grimm is the editor of the Santa Fe Reporter. She's also the publisher. She was previously with Santa Fe, New Mexican and the Associated Press. She's the past president of the Society of Professional Journalists, Rio Grande chapter. Algernon Damasa is a local and statewide reporter for the Las Cruces Sun News, reporting on education, local government and politics and investigative pieces. His Desert Sage column appears weekly in the Sun News and other Gannett papers and even USA Today. He is also now on the board with me, the Society of Professional Journalists, Rio Grande. Julia Dendinger is the assistant editor at the Valencia County News Bulletin. She's worked with the community paper since 2006, covering a range of issues, including property taxes, jail conditions, deputy staffing trends, road projects, animal control, illegal dumping, and as she puts it in her bio, the ever flat county budget. <laughs> she is also on the board of the Society of Professional Journalists, Rio Grande chapter. Rashad Mahmoud is the co-director of the New Mexico Local News Fund and also my former co-worker at KUNM. He worked in international development in Washington, D.C., Egypt, and Iraq. He worked for two years as a business journalist in Egypt. And after coming to Albuquerque, he worked with Generation Justice and was the coordinator for the Public Health New Mexico Project, KUNM. And we have our guest from Florida, Alicia Zuckerman, editorial director with WLRN in Miami, where she oversees narrative and investigative audio journalism. And she's the past president of the Public Media Journalists Association. So I'd like first to talk about the challenges and then talk about how you've adapted and even some possible solutions. So I wanna start with you, Julianne. The closures of newspapers has really hit weekly, it's the hardest, but Santa Fe Reporter is still standing and actually doing investigative work, the most expensive work in journalism. I know it's been a really challenging year though. Can you talk about some of the biggest issues that you all have faced this year? Sure, you know, I'm actually coming to you this morning from our brand new office space, which is no longer in the downtown Santa Fe tourism and government core, which I think is a really good place to start because we made the decision to leave that pricey downtown real estate and continue putting more of every dollar we earn toward local journalism, which is really, as you mentioned, um, you know, it's, it's what we do and it's expensive. Um, the reporter has had to uh, lay off some staff, including uh, people from the newsroom and folks from our advertising team, uh, both of which are really painful for the long-term kind of picture in the newsroom. Um, we've also had to cut our circulation, and because local businesses have been forced to close by the pandemic um, and aren't putting on events and aren't hosting um you know, dinners and all the things that people advertise in a, a weekly paper. Um, we've also had to cut our page count. So people in Santa Fe are seeing a smaller reporter. They're having a little bit harder of a time finding a paper copy because they're not out on the streets to grab it and because we're having to put fewer out there. Um, kind of the other side of that is that our internet traffic has grown tremendously and the pressure to continually produce journalism every day on the internet is still there and in fact it's it's mounting and if you want to continue to compete in this media environment and make sure that you are reaching your audience at every critical turn um you know you've got to be there and so the the journalists are worn thin from the uh, pressure and there's you know uh, just a tremendous amount I think that we're all carrying. There's stones that we're carrying, um, but yeah, a lot of uh, all weeklies like the reporter uh, decided to stop publishing during the pandemic, or they were forced to stop publishing. Um, many of them kept their internet presence, but stopped doing the paper copy. Some people stopped for a little while and came back. Others shuttered completely. And so yeah, we feel really fortunate in Santa Fe that our um, philanthropic community uh, are just 
average Santa Fans who are kicking $5 or $10 a month to the reporter, um, all the way up to people like the local news fund, which are, you know, subsidizing some of our reporting. Um, you know, we're making it happen. And we are, um, you know, I'm kind of the, that person who hates to hear people put the word failing before local news. And I don't like to dwell on all the things that we're not covering. I'd like to say that we're covering the most we can, the best we can, like, every day and we're not gonna stop. You guys rely, your internet presence growing, you don't have a paywall, right? Correct, you know, one of the great things about the Santa Fe Reporter is that we're reaching everybody on um, both sides of the digital divide is like how I like to say it. Um, so all of our uh, products on, uh, all of our digital products are free and all of our print products are free and it's our intention that we don't stop that plan either. Even as your, you know, advertising was declining even before the pandemic, which is our audience probably may or may not understand. That was the business model. You sell advertising that creates space where you put news stories. A lot of that has gone away with Craigslist, with the internet. People are very used to free content. So there's been a variety of approaches to that, including paywalls, but you guys have decided not to do that and find other sources of revenue. Yeah, what we've really done is we launched a program called Friends of the Reporter. Um, it's something that a lot of all weeklies are doing. And, you know, I think you're seeing it start to creep into the dailies as well. Um, just like if you appreciate our journalism and you would like us to keep doing what we're doing for the community, but you don't have a business and you don't need to buy an advertisement, here's a way that you can support us. Um, and, you know, really the range of response to that has been great. You know, we've gotten a couple of checks with commas in them, and we have a lot of people who are making, you know, small donations every month. And it just, um, it means a lot too for those stones that we're all carrying to know that people from our community want to help lighten the load. I, full disclosure, I'm one of those supporters of the. Republic. Thanks, Megan. <laughs> Uh, Julia, some similar questions for you. Uh, you are the classic kind of community newspaper. Um, not a daily, right? You guys publish several times no, a week? No, we're once a week now. Okay. That's, you've gone to once a week. It used to be more. We were twice a week. Um, so we, I think, are in a little bit of a different position uh, than a lot of the weeklies. We haven't had to make any cuts um, during this year, thankfully. Um, that's because four or five years ago, um, those cuts were made. <laughs> Um, when I started at the paper in 2006, uh, we had eight people in the editorial staff, large advertising staff. We even had our own copy editor. It was the golden era, you guys. Um, but by now, copy editor now? Uh, no, we do not have a copy editor on staff anymore. Um, we, we copy edit our own stuff. We, we trade off. That's, uh, okay. always an adventure. Um, but we, we get it done as best we can. So we, we've gone from, you know, eight, nine people down to four from twice a week to once a week. So with this, um, like you talked about the reduction in advertising, thankfully we didn't have to make cuts, um, but we've been carrying a lot of different um, job duties for several years now. And Weirdly, we're used to a lot of it, um, but, you know, with the pandemic, with this being election year, um, that's brought a lot of different pressures because we can't do the job the way we do it. We can't just go to things. We can't just go see people um, in our community. And that's a lot of what we do um, is you stop by City Hall and you just roam around because you know everybody and you pop in the, you know, finance director's door and you're like, hey, what's going on? Um, but this year, a lot of that's been curtailed. So we've kind of, uh, a lot more phone work, but, um, but yeah, it's, um, it's, we've definitely upped our, um, our online presence. We've, we've done a lot more stuff on the web, uh, especially early on March, April, May. I, I mean, I was writing and rewriting stories every few hours, posting multiple times, just pushing, pushing, pushing information out there because people, ne they needed to know what to do. Where can I go? What's safe? What's not safe? What are the rules? 
Um, and they were always, as we know, changing for those first few months because we were just making it up as we went along. Um, so it's, um, we kind of differ uh, from the reporter that we do, we're more of a, I guess, traditional uh, model. We have a paywall. We took it down for several months. Um, and as things kind of calmed down and became established, we brought it back. Um, nobody likes our paywall per se. Um, <laughs> a lot of people support us. We have a lot, a good, a healthy base of subscribers. Um, we've kind of put it out there and asked people, you know, what, you know, would you think about, you know, would you just support us to support us? And, um, and I think this is a bit of the social media echo chamber that we get because uh, the overwhelming uh, majority was like, no, we don't like you. And I'm like, well, thank you. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. So, yeah, I mean, we, we they, put, so they it, say they don't like you, but they would probably complain if you went away or complain you're not covering something. Oh, yes, <laughs> they do. They tell us all the time the things we're not covering. Um <laughs> So it's a, it, and like I said, I think it's, I think it's a weird echo chamber. I think we have a lot of support out there. Um, and as people tell us that, but when you get in that Facebook, Twitter world, the majority of the feedback is you're not doing a good job. Um, you're missing all these things. Um, why don't you do this? Um, and things like that. So, and, and sometimes why don't we do things comes down to resources. Um, sometimes it's just a, you know, I'm sorry, but that's not news, which they don't like to hear. <laughs> we get to have that conversation, which is fun. That's kind of exhausting on top of everything else you're dealing with. Yeah, the, I, I have friends um, who are, do marketing and social media management. And I, I really, one of my best friends, I made fun of her for a long, long time because <laughs> I'm like, gosh, it's Facebook. How hard is that? Um, and now, yeah, I, I have apologized to her so many times <laughs> because now that, you know, again, we're, we're four people in the newsroom. So we manage social media, we run the website, we write, photo, I mean, we, do, we carry it all. So yeah, so now that I am much more involved in helping to manage that aspect of things um not only just talking to people but getting things up posting things making sure we're out there and visible yeah it's a uh, it's a lot harder than uh, than i initially <laughs> was told so <laughs> it's Algernon, as a reporter you're covering a huge part of the state but the papers under the group um that you work for is owned by Gannett They've also had layoff furloughs. So how are, are you adapting to cover so much this year when there's fewer of you? Uh, by doing our best to cover it all. Um, and what the environment is like is that we are subject to these business cycles where they will lay off a bunch of people at once, including reporters and not just reporters. And so you'll lose some of the experience that's in the newsroom. And then when things are more hospitable to hiring again, we hire more people, which tends to be younger journalists, which is, which is a good, it's good to uh, launch careers, but You've now brought in younger journalists after losing the older and more experienced journalists, as well as they're losing their local knowledge. And the real value of this is having people on the ground who know the community. Um, and so things can happen more quickly. Uh, so there's, there's always this trade-off that I think is less about... Um, being effective as a news operation than it is about the bottom line and the business cycle of the day. So how do you decide on a given week? I mean, yeah, you could work 90 hours a week and cover everything you should, but that's also not realistic. So how do you make those choices? I'm trying to remember, right now, we have a lot of reporters. Um, we're all sort of, I, I'm the oldest reporter in the in the newsroom at two and a half years. I know that. Um, 
which is, you know, obscene. Um, but at a time when there really were just a, a handful of us trying to cover everything, I mean, we did no statewide reporting. We cut that back. We weren't reporting. We were relying heavily on other news sources. So we were relying a lot more heavily on the AP, the Associated Press, as well as the Albuquerque Journal and the Santa Fe New Mexican um, for some of that statewide reporting that matters to our region. Uh, you know, it's just a matter of letting things go um, and having to do things quickly at the same time because we are internet facing, we're digital. And so there's that pressure that Julianne was talking about of producing um, content for your website every single day as well as a print product um, and trying to get information out there as quickly as possible that's also good quality information that's vetted and uh, that matters, that's, that's good journalism. And so we would have a daily meeting and just kind of try to spread ourselves out as much as possible and day by day to talk about what it is that we could cover. And uh, it's, it's a lot easier when you have more reporters. Yeah, yeah. And especially if, well, it's good to bring up young reporters, but they need mentors to help them figure things out. So they're not gonna be as fast, they're not gonna know as much um, on the ground, so. Um, I wanted to also bring up another challenge in the area of trust. The Toe Center for Digital Journalism and the New York Times have both done in-depth work um, on what they call pink slime news sites. We have a number of them in New Mexico. These are, they look like local outlets. They're in fact disguised, um, or I'm sorry, they're designed to distribute mostly conservative talking points disguised as straight up news. And uh, I do need to point out here that this story was broken by one of these endangered local news outlets we're talking about, the Lansing State Journal in Michigan before these larger news outlets picked it up. Some of these are actually pay for play. Uh, that's the New York Times discovered. Someone is paying for that article to be in there. Um, we have more information on them in the resource list that's uh, along with this video, below this video. But I wanted to ask you all if this means you have to do even more education about what you do as a news outlet and why you matter. And our audience may wonder what is the difference between taking advertising and make, using that to create space for stories versus paying for an article. I'll throw that out there for, do you wanna jump on that Algernon or Julia? Um, I, I don't, so far, and I, cause I've, I've looked at a lot of the, the sites you're talking about here in New Mexico. Um, it, one thing I find weird is, is the way they're presenting themselves. They're like, hey, we're your local news outlet. And they're, they're playing on that whole news desert um, scenario where they're presenting themselves as there's no one else covering you. And what I find hilarious is that there's several of these in Albuquerque, Santa Fe. I think there's a couple in Cruces. And I'm really, really super sure <laughs> we have newspapers in those communities. <laughs> so th th it's, it's weird. Um, they're trying to take this approach that, hey, nobody else is doing this for you. So here we are. Yet there's all these other papers doing that work. So um, we don't have one down here. No one's tried to glom onto Valencia County um, for whatever reason. I think we're cool. Um, I, think, I think the challenge, yeah, in that talking about the pay to play aspect of it is that, it, yeah, readers, do, um, a lot of times they don't or, or they don't discern between what's an ad and what's what we call editorial content. And, and then it gets even more cloudy when you have things like advertorials that look like an article, but somebody paid for that. Um, and as, as reporters- Do you guys have policies against running those? Do you have to- um, You know, we don't get a lot of requests for them. And so our policy, our policy is we, we, we've kind of taken the rule with, with political advertising. If somebody is paying for content in our paper and it's not just an at obvious, hey, here's a big splashy, our washers are on sale this week ad. If it's something that could be perceived as something we made, we very clearly label it as this is paid advertising. 
um, no doubt. Uh, we don't want that confusion. Um, and we did a little bit of a public education piece uh, right before COVID. Uh, we were going to do like an Ask Us Anything kind of scenario Facebook Live. And we did. We went over that. And I, I literally held up a paper and pointed to the element because it's a visual thing. And like, if you look at this, this is an ad. If you look at this, this is something we wrote or it's a letter. Um, so I, yeah, I think the pink, the, the pink slime stuff is definitely going to probably become more and more difficult. Um, and the problem, I think part of them right now, at least in New Mexico that I've noticed is they're, they're aggregating and pulling from legitimate sources. So they're like, as reported in the journal or mm -hmm. according to the press release from Department of Health. So, I mean, yeah, that's, that's news. That's, that's accurate information. I, you know, you can't say it's not. Um, definitely a slant um, in how they, what they choose to aggregate. Um, but I, I, yeah, I think we as news organizations, we need to really start amping up our efforts to communicate to our readers. Yes, people can pay to put something in our newspaper. That doesn't make us biased. That doesn't make us, you know, um, right wing or left wing it's they paid for their content and that's our that's our business model that's how we survive and it is totally separate from what we do as reporters so that's you know that's something we always try to stress but i think we're going to have to be more proactive with it with this this pink slime thing is is it's going to get out of control really soon i think and i have a couple of links to articles about that and as we're talking, I think I will also put links to the Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics. Yes. Again, people might not understand we do try to operate under a code of ethics. Um, that might surprise some people <laughs> negative opinions of the media. Um, let me see. Let me jump to my. Yes. Actually, so Rashad, I want to turn to you. We'll talk a bit later more fully about how the News Fund is trying to address some of these problems, but could you give us a brief description of what the News Fund is? And also, um, in your work with outlets around the state, what are some of the issues that you're seeing that are hampering um, keeping local journalism going? Sure. Um, so the New Mexico Local News Fund is a relatively new organization uh, that got started in 2018, but really, really 2019 is when we started our work. Um, it was founded by Sarah Gustavus, you know, a longtime journalist here in New Mexico, used to work for KUNM and New Mexico PBS. And, you know, our goal is really to support the entire local journalism ecosystem throughout the state, um, you know, and make sure that the news and information needs of New Mexicans are being met. And so, you know, that includes working with all the great newsrooms, you know, on the call here, um, as well as uh, supporting the potential rise of like new solutions to, to local news and information. Um, and so, you know, we do that through a number of different ways. Uh, we started uh, a fellowship program for recent uh, UNM graduates uh, to help help them get jobs in newsrooms, because you know one of the um, problems that we heard when we were first talking with. Uh, students and journalists is, you know, just the lack of opportunities for early. And I know Algernon was talking about how, you know, so much of their newsroom is new journalists, but, um, you know, the young grads we were talking about. Say, I don't want to be cynical, but one reason that's happening in Algernon's newsroom is you can pay them a lot oh, less. Of course, yeah. <laughs> um, but most of the graduates we were talking with felt like they had to leave New Mexico if they wanted to start their journalism careers. You know, they had to go to, to Colorado, they had to go to Texas, they had to go to Arizona. Um, and, you know, one of our values at the News Fund is that people from New Mexico, from the communities that they um, grew up in, uh, have the potential to be the best journalists there. Not to say that people from other places can't report on those communities. But, you know, there's a learning curve around the uh, diverse populations in New Mexico. And so if people want to be journalists here, what, what can we do to, to pr help provide that opportunity for them? Um, and so um, we started just with UNM grads, and then we ended up expanding that to NMSU graduates. And we're hoping to include other universities in this next round of the program. Um, we also directly support newsrooms through collaboration grants, you know, collaboration um, hasn't been talked about much yet, but we see it as a real opportunity to 
provide services to the, the audiences of newsrooms um, by bringing in content from other parts of the state. You know, I heard, uh, you know, Algernon talking about the lack of statewide coverage and having to rely more on like the AP and uh, the journal and stuff like that. And obviously, you know, in an ideal world, you know, we could all do all that reporting in-house, right? But with the nature of the limited resources that journalism faces, um, there's real opportunities to sort of draw on the strengths of other newsrooms around the state um, to, to bring that information to our to our audiences. So, um, you know, we funded some small scale collaborations last year that are finishing up now. Um, for example, uh, Julianne at the Santa Fe Reporter worked with, um, with KUNM and New Mexico PBS to start a legislative podcast to focus. It was a really great daily podcast talking about, you know, during the legislative session, what's, what's going on, talking to experts. Um, just giving uh, everyone's audience a, a deeper dive than what's usually available. Um, and then that ended up morphing into a COVID podcast that uh, was really, really crucial uh, when things were so up in the air and unknown. And that's that type of like organic collaboration that, you know, as the news fund, we we're super excited to see, right? Because, because that infrastructure was already in place because of the legislative podcast um, members could just start a new service for their audience. And obviously, you know, it took a lot of work and staff hours. Um, but um, I, I see that as a big opportunity for newsrooms across the state. And most recently, we're in the process of just launching a Southern New Mexico journalism collaboration um, with funding uh, from us, from the Democracy Fund, uh, which is our main funder, and from the Thornburg Foundation, um, which is bringing together newsrooms in Southern New Mexico to, for similarly for legislative coverage. And so there's going to be one shared reporter. Um, the partners will help sort of guide what that reporter is going to work on. But then that content is available to newsrooms around the state. Um, and I think I just, um, this is a little off topic, but I think I want to talk a little bit more about just sort of the shape of news in New Mexico a little bit, right? Um, because, you know, at the beginning, of, Megan, you were talking about, um, you know, those long-term trends of, you know, newsrooms having less and less staff. Um, and I think it's important to localize that here, right? Um, and so, you know, in New Mexico, there are four counties that literally don't have any source of local news. Um, you know, those are mostly rural counties. Um, and then besides those four, I believe it's 18 other counties only have one single source of local news in those counties, right? And so um, really the areas that are, you know, even though newsrooms are struggling, you know, it's really like Albuquerque and Santa Fe have several local news options available to them. They also, you know, the TV stations cover, you know, central and northern New Mexico. But southern New Mexico, you know, even though it has the the Las Cruces Bulletin, Las Cruces Sun News, um, you know, there's a real hole in a lot of parts of southern New Mexico, uh, which is why it's an area of focus for us. Um, a lot of people don't realize that the uh, they're actually in the El Paso media market for TV. And so, uh, lo you know, local television is a really important way that a lot of people get their news. Um, I think, you know, there's definitely room for um, improvement and more dedication to like serious investigative journalism in TV news, but it is a way that a lot of people are getting access to the news and information they need. And in Southern New Mexico, a lot of that uh, just isn't there because the they don't really get the Albuquerque TV stations. Um, and so, and that's not to talk about, mention all of the rural communities in New Mexico that have basically no source of local news in those communities. Um, uh, yeah, and so, um, and then also on the, in terms of like the jobs level, I think people think of it as it's been sort of like a long, slow decline, but that's not really how the pattern has shaped, has shaken out, right? Um, you know, until the financial downturn and, you know, the internet had been a long, around a long time. Craigslist had been around, long, around a long time eating away at, uh, you know, newspaper media margins. But it really was like a sort of a long, slow decline until the economic crisis hit in 2008. And it's like all of a sudden that just sort of kicked the legs out from under a lot of local newspapers. And so we saw a really huge decline uh, here in New Mexico and around the country, right around that 2008 to 2012 period, 
then there's like this sort of period of stability. And, you know, one of our biggest concerns is that the economic consequences from COVID are going to really kick out the legs from under a bunch of new newsrooms. Um, and, you know, we, we saw the closing of the Los Alamos Monitor, um, which is a longtime local paper in Los Alamos. Um, and so, you know, as the news fund, one of our priorities is to really um, keep try to keep outlets alive in these difficult, challenging economic times. And I, I should have said another full disclosure, I am a, be a beneficiary of the local news fund as are many of you I'm doing a podcast with PBS on in New Mexico political report in the cannabis industry. So also um, I'm, I'm actually, uh, I'm actually handing in um, a draft of a project today for one of these collaborations that the local news fund is supporting, um, which is great because, you know, as Rashid's as Rashad is referring to, um, there's sort of an ecosystem and it's not just lots of uh, smaller or bigger newsrooms working together, but it's also newsrooms that are funded by different kinds of business models. So I work for one of the largest capitalist media organizations, um, but there are also these nonprofits that are funded differently. And I think that that makes a difference in terms of their ability to support people doing different kinds of work. So there's a lot of nonprofit newsrooms from which we benefit New Mexico in depth, Searchlight New Mexico and, and more. Um, and the Santa Fe Reporter is you know, funded differently than a newspaper like the Sun News is. And uh, all of that is, that, that ecosystem is really valuable, I think, as a way to adapt to the conditions. Also, I just really quickly wanted to describe uh, for anybody who's not familiar with desert, news deserts, exactly how one develops because I live in one. I report in Las Cruces, but I live in Deming, New Mexico, which is in Luna County, right down in this little pocket near the US-Mexico border. There is one newspaper um, in Luna County, serving Luna County, it's the Deming Headlight, another Gannett paper. But you could also, until recently, get papers like the Albuquerque Journal. Um, you could get other newspapers, typically I saw the Albuquerque Journal, but you could get the New York Times in some select places and things like that as a print product or online, right? Well, Gannett made a decision at a certain point to reduce print editions, which meant that it reduced the people who deliver print newspapers to the community. That didn't just affect people getting the Deming headlight. It affected everybody getting any newspaper, Albuquerque Journal, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, whatever it is, USA Today, whatever paper they wanted. Um, it was all, de this monopoly created a situation where once they started reducing print editions, you couldn't get any other newspaper either. So to a point where if you live in Deming, it's extremely difficult to get any newspaper at all at this point. And I'm guessing your internet is not very robust? That is the other piece of it, because you can say, oh, well, they could just go online. Not every place in, in Luna County or Hidalgo County, Columbus down near the border, they don't necessarily have reliable internet service. Never mind the whole issue of paywalls and having to now subscribe to multiple websites, because we still haven't worked out a, an online digital wallet where you can pay something and subscribe to five newspapers. We still haven't worked that out for some reason. And so that's how a news desert really does form. And mm -hmm. so it becomes more and more and more difficult to get vetted information. And so it's hardly surprising or outrageous that people go to whatever social media that they can access to get information. And that information is a variable quality. And so that's really the danger of a news desert. And it arises from business decisions and business models. And I think that this ecosystem of newsrooms that do different things, a nonprofit that can do larger investigative projects, for instance, uh, working with local reporters that don't have the time to do that, but they can contribute. I think that that ecosystem is a vital adaptation to provide information. Thank you, Algernon. That's really a great insight. Um, I, uh, let's see, on top of these challenges, uh, which are many, I also wanted to address the mental well-being of journalists. Um, this has been in the news recently here 
has impacted me personally with the suicide of our own news director, Hannah Colton at KUNM. Um, before I move on, sorry, I wanna make sure I'm doing this. And I wanna make sure people understand that I bring that up because her parents have been very open in talking about that. Otherwise, I would not be so open talking about it. Um, these are the things we have to balance. But as journalists know, we have a, a whole series of best practices about reporting on suicide. So I want to put this up here because um, we're not going to talk in depth about it, but um, it's important to have this up for anyone watching while we talk about it. And um, as her, her parents expressed in her obituary, Hannah already had issues like depression. So I wanna be clear, I'm not here to blame journalism, but like many journalists, she was covering a lot of really challenging stories this year from protests to the pandemic. Many people don't quite understand how much we resemble sometimes first responders, especially during traumatic events. And honestly, we had a grief counselor work with our team at KUNM recently and he even he, he didn't he told me later he didn't realize that he didn't understand that dynamic so that's why i asked alicia zuckerman to join us because she has guided her team through stories such as the parkland school shooting and natural disasters um, i really appreciated alicia thank you for joining us here in new mexico by the magic of sky of uh, zoom <laughs> um could you, alicia could you talk about how these challenges that all the newsrooms are facing that we've been talking about are exacerbated by covering traumatic events and how you as a manager have worked to keep your team safe physically and mentally sure well megan thank you so much for including me and this has been such a interesting discussion and it's such a local news is you know as we all know well but hopefully people watching this will feel as well just so critical to the functioning of our society. And also, I, I just first want to say, I'm so sorry, Megan, for the loss of Hannah and you and your newsroom and her family and, and friends and everybody who loved her and was touched by her. Um, it's a huge loss. And uh, I really appreciate that you have this information up on the screen here. Uh, it is really important. Um, yeah, our newsroom has actually talked a lot about this, uh, about the trauma uh, of, um, working within this field, there are traumatic aspects of it. Um, the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma, which is based at Columbia University, has uh, informed a lot of our discussions about this um, element of practicing journalism. Uh, and they also refer to journalists as first responders. Um, and I think thinking of ourselves that way, and for those of us who are managers as I am, um, you know, it's, it is really useful to think of ourselves that way and to especially think of the reporters who are in the field and maybe even now not in the field, but still covering stories and talking to sources um, day in and day out about things that are really difficult. Uh, and also having sort of, you know, living in this time is a difficult time period. So even if they're not covering stories that are difficult, I think our day-to-day -day lives are a lot more difficult and there's a lot more trauma in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, because of COVID and, and other things as well. Um, this has not been an easy election season, for example. Um, the political climate has been hard. Journalists have been, you know, distrusted and, and called and worse, as, as you alluded to earlier, much worse. Um, so, you know, I one thing I kind of wanted to say is that when I think about local journalism, it's, um, I think, trying to, this idea of trying to be universal and trying to have a universal appeal is really overrated, um, you know, and can often do a disservice to the, the core of what local journalism is and should be and, you know, covering different communities. You know, I just think trying to have universal appeal is not the way to go. Um, but there is this one element that I do think is universal, which is that the sort of weight that journalists carry, um, regardless of which communities they are covering or where they're practicing journalism or local journalism. I think starting from that point of view um, is, is very useful. And again, you know, some of this was informed by the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma, but some of it really predates that. Um, we had um, really uh, committed 
through one reporter and then that grew out to several reporters in our newsroom routinely covering gun violence and covering it um, not from like the perspective of like this person was just shot and it's breaking news, but covering it over a long period of time, talking to a family a year after, five years after um, they lost somebody to gun violence, talking about the fact that so many of these um, gun violence deaths are unsolved. Also talking about the fact that the vast majority of um, gun violence does not result in death. Um, and so what is the trauma that that leaves, the resulting trauma? So that was part of what informed our newsroom's kind of focus on thinking about covering trauma and how that affects our communities, our audiences, but also, uh, and I say audiences because, you know, we're um, public radio and so uh, it's, we also do have readers online, of course, so it encompasses all of that. Um, but also um, their own well-being. And I, and I have to say, and I'm really heartened by this piece of it, which is that this generation of journalists now um, really are so much more open and frankly self-aware about their own mental well-being um, than uh, previous, maybe the, the generation that I came up in and, you know, pre certainly previous generations, the sort of hard-boiled, grizzled, like nothing affects you um, kind of sensibility, um, which probably wasn't ever true to begin with, but it was just like, don't let it show, you know? <laughs> and now- It is the archetype, yes. <laughs> can I say that again, Megan? It is the archetype, sort of. Exactly, exactly. And it's funny, I used the word hard-boiled in describing this in a conversation with our newsroom last week, um, because I think I was telling them, somebody had said something that was really like focused on the idea of like their own well-being. Um, and, uh, and I said that, I said, you know, it's so nice to hear, you know, that this idea of the hard-boiled journalist is just like not the norm anymore. And they weren't, they were sort of like hard-boiled. Wow, that's a weird phrase for <laughs> Um, you know, which was good. I thought that was good. I mean, I hope that that sort of goes by the wayside. And, um, and I think that the more in tune we are with our own well-being, the better journalists we can be and the more empathetic journalists we can be. And that's such an important part of it is like when somebody tells you something, even if it's like on a, this is another note that I was recently giving, you know, if somebody says something on say a live talk show or something where, I, they tell you something that's really traumatic that they went through. Like, I want to hear that person respond saying, I'm so sorry. Like, that's really like respond the way you would in a conversation, uh, you know, not just as the idea of what a journalist, you know, I don't know, like the idea of sort of being this, you know, nothing, nothing gets sort of being that's extractive. You. Right. Yeah, right. You exactly. Yeah. So some of the ways that, you know, we've done that um, is, uh, again, just we talk about it a lot. We really, we, it's, it's sort of like in staff meetings, um, you know, we've hopefully and create, I hope, created an environment where people feel comfortable uh, coming to us, talking to each other. Um, I think they're, they've become pretty tight knit. Uh, and, and by the way, when I do editor trainings for PMJA, Public Media Journalists Association that Megan referenced earlier, this is also, we do a whole session as part of the editor's training because editors are managers and editors are sort of like working um, up close and personal with stories, you know, day to day. Uh, even if an editor isn't like a formal manager in a newsroom setting, like, you know, at, at, in some capacity, you're a manager. Um, and so really making sure, hoping to really make sure that editors also have like the language to talk about this and to, and to help uh, reporters feel um, just connected to that, to that world. I'm hearing an alarm go off in the other room. Are you guys hearing that? I can go and mute that. I think oh, I yes. should, I think I should mute that. Just give me one moment. I'll, okay. I'm sorry. I'll be right back. That's fine. I'll ask Alicia this too, because I think um, I, I was curious, given all these factors, and you know the necessity to maintain your own well-being and mental health. How do you guys go about prioritizing what you cover in terms of your resources? I'll let you jump in on that, Alicia. You and I talked. So, given all that, how do you prioritize what you're going to cover? I know so WL that's a piece of it is too. A bit bigger than a lot of public media stations, but you still got to. 
Yeah, ask our reporters, and I think they would probably feel not necessarily feel that way, <laughs> even though we know that it, it's no, true. We're, we're like certainly we not one of the yeah. right, exactly. We're certainly not one of the biggest, but we're certainly not one of the smallest. And um, it's uh, you know, it's something that comes up. It's like one of the most common conversations I have with reporters is to and and with my colleagues, uh, my you know fellow editors and managers is to um, how do we prioritize, you know, how, and just to encourage reporters to say like, okay, I know you want to do all of this. And as a newsroom, we want to do all of this. I mean, every day when we have our news meeting, we come up with dozens of, you know, it feels like dozens of really great ideas. How many of them can we execute on well? And I think Julianne, you had said, you know, you don't dwell on all the things we're not, you're not covering, you know, and I, that, that phrase resonated a lot um, to really figure out what are the things we're going to be able to do really well and to have a real sense of um, ownership around those things and know that there are things we're not getting to that we wish we could get to. Um, but you know, we're not, I, you know, we're not working. I don't want anyone working 16 hours a day. I don't want that. You know, like we, I'll tell reporters sometimes like, you know, I think you should take a day off now. Like I think, or, you know, look at the calendar, like when's the next time you can take off or like start late tomorrow, leave early, take a very long lunch. You know, like I, I try really, we try to, um, and it's funny how often, like I have to, like, I feel like I, we say that more than like people are asking for things, you know, like, like we're telling them, Hey, like, are you letting too much, you know, down, you know, vacation time or, or personal time or whatever build up, you know, like, don't forget that you have this available to you. Um, and then I think, you know, over time that sort of writes itself, but as far as how to prioritize, I mean, I think all of you all touched a lot on that on that, you know, trying to figure out um, what are the topics that are really important to your community? How are we going to make our communities better? Um, citizens help them uh, make better decisions about the way they live their lives and the way that they um, operate in their communities um, with each other. And especially, I think, to me, one of the most important elements of local journalism is um, making sure that um, the way that we are practicing journalism results in people understanding each other better, like understanding a life that's different from their own. You know, um, nobody can live a hundred lives at one time. That's nobody's fault. <laughs> um, but that's where we come in and we can at least offer some exposure and hopefully some understanding and empathy about the way somebody else is living their lives. And that hopefully that helps communities make better decisions together. I think it's really important to talk about that, how you prioritize. Um, and, and one of my strategies is to constantly tell our community that the people in our newsroom are humans at work. We live in Santa Fe, we cover Santa Fe because we believe in the better future. We wanna be active participants here. And you know, the fact that we're, as journalists, we're called to witness things that are, not easy and we're not gonna look away um, that, that, you know, try to remind my team um, just, you know, what that really means. And also to encourage them to go after stories that they believe in as human beings. You know, you get a much better story out of a reporter who cares about and is interested in the topic um, rather than if you kind of come from the top and say, this is important and this is what we're gonna cover this week. Um, yeah. Those are kind of things that we try to work into our decision making as well. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you made that point. I really think that's so important. And um, and that's why like figuring out like who makes up a newsroom is so important, too, because what people are passionate about, you want you don't want that to be all one thing, you know, but you do want journalists to be passionate about the thing that they're covering, you know, and um you know, sometimes in edits, I'll say to somebody, especially when they get into the weeds, like, wait, 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 like, tell me why you wanted to do this story to begin with, because we are largely an enterprise shop. We don't do a ton of, like, we, you know, rely a lot on the story ideas of, of the reporters. And then at some point, you know, to say, wait, 
explain to me again, like why this, why this was interesting to you to begin with, like what, what fascinated you about this, you know, story. And then that like helps kind of, sometimes that helps like write the ship when we get kind of into the weeds. I'm mixing metaphors here, but, but yeah, that, that, that idea of like the passion for the story or for the, for the beat or for the topic is, is critical. I, I, th- I think for like doing good journalism. How do you guys put yourselves out there to put that face on local journalists? Because there is this tendency to say the media in all caps, like we're getting faxed talking points somewhere. I don't know. So it's it's just a misconception. So are you able to overcome that as a local outlet in a way, maybe like, I don't know, the New York Times or NPR dropping in here couldn't do? Um, I I think for us, we, well, Pre-COVID, um, <laughs> like yeah. I was talking about, we um, just as a newsroom, um, you know, we, we do a lot of beat reporting. Um, so I cover a lot of county government and yeah, to put a face on who I am and what I do, I was able to, yeah, just go roam around the county building or stop by the senior center and talk to people. Um a lot of that, uh, I think for us, for me anyway, uh, I've kind of shifted a little bit more to social media, um, just putting my own stuff out, putting other people's stuff out there. Um, and it, it's interesting. I always, I always try to, and it, we all talk to people and have conversations, but there's this interesting thing I've found. Um, and I think it's because we're in a smaller community and I think I've got um, like some local longevity here. I've, I've been with the paper since 06. So there's, there's certain issues that uh, for better or worse, I have a very <laughs> uh, deep understanding of, and I know the history and people will ask like, your, what's your opinion on this? And I'm like, uh, you know, if you've known me long enough, you know, pretty much where I stand on issues, local and otherwise. But at the same time, I don't, want people to feel like I have a bias. I have an opinion about everything. I don't want them to feel like my, me and my reporting have a bias. So a lot of times, although I've, I've found when they're asking me what my opinion is, they just want to understand the topic better. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I talk about, you know, we have this ongoing non-project of a hospital for Valencia County. <laughs> non-project. <laughs> uh, well, we, 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 they passed and have collected a mill levy for eight years. Uh, we have about $26 million sitting in a right. bank. There have been a myriad of lawsuits starting in 2007. And yeah, it's, uh, we have no hospital. So... <laughs> It sounds like you pretty much own that story, Julia. Oh yes, there's there's a book in the offing. I'm quite certain. Um, but that so that's the thing. Like like people will, you know, and they'll move here or they'll they'll have been here for five years and they're like, so tell me about this hospital. And I'm like, well, uh, or you know, what do you think about it? Where should it go? That was a big fight. Location. So. I'll, I'll just kind of give them the history and I'll be like, well, you know, this is why this was thought to be a good place. And then this was thought to be a better location. And, you know, this is how we got here. And this point was brought up. And then we had the legality of whether this, um, so it's not my opinion on it. Um, because I think in a lot of ways, because I am a community member, my opinion is just build it. And that's kind of everyone's opinion, <laughs> but there's a lot of stuff to get there. So I think it's a lot of just of just having those conversations with people, explaining things to them, um, just explaining things, how government works, just those simple processes of here's how you get a zone change. There's a process. Um, it doesn't just happen, you know. Um, and I, th- I think for us, one of the key ways we've kind of made a, a, a personal connection with people in the community is, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a love-hate relationship. We have this column uh, that we run every week called People in Places, and we trade off. And so we just write about random things um, in our life. I've, I've written about my kids. I've written about my cats, the dogs. I've written about politics, for better or worse. I've written about the very real fear and possibility recently that I had a cricket in my ear. Um, there was no cricket just to, just to. You know. Thank God. 
oh, oh, you have no idea. But so it's, it's interesting because that I think for us, um, it does work to, and I know not every news outlet has that option, but it, it, it reminds people that, you know, man, we go home and I've got to deal with, with cat vomit on my carpet. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a common thing. I'm not, I'm not special. I'm not like in a bubble that isolates me from everything else that happens in our community. I still drive on our roads that aren't great. Um, <laughs> I still don't have a hospital just like you. So yeah, I mean, just, and having conversations with people you don't wanna have conversations with quite frankly, because you get the phone call and it leads off with, who do you think you are writing about this? I'm like, well, let's, uh, let's dissect that. Um, what exactly are you objecting to? So it's, yeah, it's just, it's being patient and trying not to lose your temper sometimes. I think you just brought home how important it is, uh, what we lose in a news desert, such as Algernon described, that you cannot put a human face on the people delivering your news and that can foster more mistrust Mm -hmm. which is really debilitating right now, especially Mm -hmm. to our democracy. So thank you for that, Mm -hmm. Julia. Um, We are uh, coming up on, I guess, almost out of time and I wanna respect your all's time. Um, uh, I guess if we could try to hammer home the idea, um, or I should say, we, we often try to hammer home the idea that we need to pay for journalism, darn it. You need to subscribe to your local paper which I think we'd all be on board with, but I'd like to get some final thoughts from you all for our audience um, who are watching this, what they can do, who I'm guessing if they're here that they care about local journalism and news and they may not know how to help or what to do. And so it's okay if you wanna say subscribe, that's good. <laughs> do you have other um, thoughts besides that? <laughs> yes, money, um, money helps. Um, I read something a couple months ago that kind of cap- just uh, the, the idea that, that uh, information should be free. Philosophically, I 100% agree with that. Um, information should be free. I can't work for free. Um, Outside of that, outside of subscribing, donating, um, buying an ad, I think the like we talked about, the biggest thing people can do for us is to try to understand that we are a small group of humans doing everything we can um, with the limited resources we have. I would dearly love to go back to a 10 person newsroom twice a week. I would, I would do unspeakable things um, to get us back there, frankly. We all really, really want our copy editors back full time. Oh, you have no idea. You have no idea how many things I face palm literally as I'm pulling things onto the website. I'm like, oh, four people read it and nobody caught it. I'm like, fantastic. So, yeah, I mean, we live here with you guys. We work here with you guys. Um, if, if we didn't like doing this, if we didn't like being in these communities, we would probably not be doing these jobs and we probably wouldn't be here with you. Um, and it's just, you know, I, I guess it comes down to what we're all entitled to as humans is a little grace at the end of the day. Anyone else like to chime in? Um, I guess I'll just say, um, I mean, obviously, you know, for anyone listening, please consider subscribing to your local paper, you know, um, you know, they're obviously a super valuable source of local news and information. Um, and I, and, you know, as we talked about earlier, I think people often, you know, people overgeneralize the media, right? Um, they see like how successful the New York Times is being and they just may think that like, oh, that means journalism itself is doing great overall, right? But, you know, we're moving into more of like a winner take all world in all avenues, right? And so, you know, the big national publications and um, 
and TV outlets are being really successful in hoovering up that attention and financial resources, right? Um, so, you know, do consider subscribing to your local newsrooms. Um, but at the same time, I think, um, you know, there are other ways to support yeah. local news in your community, right? Um, you know, I think when you're, we can all be more conscious, right, about what we say and share on social media, right? Like, I, I feel like as a society, that's something we're still evolving and learning how to, you know, deal with as people, right? Like, we we weren't evolved to have access to, like, this instant megaphone to, like, everyone we know all the time to, like, just share whatever we think, right? And, um, and so, you know, I think it's important to, like, think about what we are sharing, um, choose local sources that, you know, are doing this hard work when you can, right? Like elevate the profile of the people doing that hard um, work reporting in your community, um, raise that visibility because, you know, maybe that will encourage more people to, to subscribe or attend events or, um, or for nonprofit newsrooms donate. Um, and there's a lot of room, I think, for experimentation on the part of newsrooms too, like in these areas, right? Um, and you know, it's hard. You you don't want to be like, come on, newsrooms, like do more. <laughs> um, but um, you know, there's a lot of experimentation going on with new revenue sources, with um, partnering with community foundations. Um, that you know, that is part of our the New Mexico Local News Funds work, right? Um, and so, I, you know, I just encourage everyone to sort of be open to, to trying new things and experiment. And, you know, newsrooms, if you guys have ideas for new things you want to try, um, but don't quite have the resources or information to do them, you know, feel free to get in touch with us and we can potentially help you. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's what I would say. That's awesome, Rashad. Thank you. And something that doesn't involve money is just talking to your local journalists. Um, every story that I publish has my uh, email address. It has my phone number. It also has, um, you know, this is what I use my social media platforms for as well. Now, granted, we don't have time to spend our whole day talking to people online, but I spend a part of my day doing that for sure. And trying to extend trustworthy communication to my community and letting people know that that's two way and that you can, you can approach a journalist and we're busy and we might not get back to you right away. And we might not have time for a lengthy conversation about what your neighbors might be doing, but, um, but, but we're interested and, and in listening and hearing from you that, 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 that is, something that we value strongly. And I think that connecting with us as humans helps to humanize both us and our communities so that there's really a two-way communication there and a, a mutual hearing and understanding. Thank you, Algernon. Uh, Bethany, I will kick it to you if you you've been our de facto audience right now. Is there anything you wanted to ask or? <laughs> um, I just, I think that this was such a, um, a really rich conversation. And I, uh, I think that it's so generous of all of you to, uh, to come on here and share the humanistic <laughs> side of yourself, share your, your humanity, because, um, because I do agree that it's, there is this, the media is this label that is sort of overarching and it gets it gets attached to people's cynicism and which there's a lot of cynicism that's that's happening right now and so um i just really appreciate uh being able to hear all of your voices and um and being rooted and through your conversation being rooted in um you know your own uh, what inspires you to continue to come back to this to this work and why you do it and why you feel attached and um, attached to your communities. And so I just thank you. Those are those are my my comments. And I hope everyone enjoyed it um, tuning in. And, and it's the second in our series. There's one you can also go to that's about news literacy.
transparency and trust that we did previously. We touched on some of those issues here. So mm -hmm. I encourage you to go check that out as well. Yeah, and you had mentioned, Megan, also, um, there will be below this video on YouTube, there will be a list of resources, um, helpful links, um, also touching on media literacy, also touching on what we talked about today. Uh, and so the New Mexico Humanities Council, thanks you all. And thanks, Megan. Thanks a lot.